saw it, which I agree, and you know, it's obvious to anybody who knows the book of Acts that Holy Spirit birthed the church. So it's a really great study, and we're not going to rush through it. We're going to take our time. Um, tonight, we're using this book by the Sanfords called Awakening the Slumbering Spirit. So if anything we talk about tonight resonates for you, um, you can really dig in deeper and, and get a whole book about it. They wrote it uh, with Paula's brother-in-law, I believe. Lee Bowman uh, is, a, is a family member of theirs, and I think it was Paula's brother-in-law. Uh, really deep, rich study. Um, I'm going to use the phrase called being present to the moment. Uh, I first heard that by Lance Wall now. And he was talking about how the prophetic lifestyle keeps us very alert and very awake and present to the moment. I have one example, you may or may not know this, but when the, when the show uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire first came out with Regis, the, uh, the first guy to win a million dollars was an accountant, ironically enough. And you know how that they, can, they get these three different uh, ways that they can get help, right? So they could ask the audience and I forget this phone a friend, and what was the third one? I don't even remember. But he still had one left when he got to the million dollar question. And they asked him the question, and he said, I'd like to phone a friend. And uh, Regis said, who? And he said, my father. So Regis calls the father and says, hey, your son's got a half a million dollars in the bank, and he's going for the million. He's only got one question left, but he needs your help. Are you going to help him? And everybody's like all excited in the audience. And go, OK, and they start the timer. They ask, the fa they ask the father the question, and uh, the son says, Dad, don't worry. I already know the answer. I just want to tell you I'm about to win a million dollars. <laughs> OK? Like, it's the coolest thing ever of somebody being present to the moment. Like, who would think to be that you know, composed when you're about to win a million dollars? And, and to just say, you know, and Regis, you should see the, the look on Regis's face. Like he's been in showbiz his whole life. I don't think he ever saw anything like that. And I like to remember that because there's something about being really sure of who you are in God that gives you a confidence that allows you to stay relaxed. And the enemy doesn't want you to stay relaxed. He wants you to get hijacked in your emotions because you won't make good decisions when you're hijacked. And, Jazz musicians are known as being very relaxed. I have to use a musical analogy because that's, you know, kind of one of the languages I speak and I also have heard it said and, you know, like the expression act cool is a contradiction, right? Because the whole point of being cool is that you're not acting, you're really relaxed. And, and musicians, if they're uptight, it shows in the way they play and they're nervous and, and everything gets all tense in the way they play. So when you see players that are really comfortable and are excellent at what they do, they're living in the moment and they're enjoying the moment. So the last little story, if you haven't heard me say it, I've told it enough times, but just bears repeating. Uh, in that jazz vein, I saw a concert with George Benson and Les Paul back in the 1970s, long time ago. And George Benson just told a story to the audience, small crowd, 100 people in a, in a little theater. And uh, he said, I played, uh, my, one of my first jobs was with Miles Davis and John Coltrane. And I was only 19 years old. He's playing jazz guitar at 19, and these guys are legends, right? So the way jazz works is, like, first the trumpet player goes, and then the jazz player goes, and then the guitar player. They all just do, they just do solos that's not planned. So the crowd claps after Miles Davis does his part, and then John Coltrane, the crowd claps. And then after he does his part, they really clap loud, like louder than the other two. So they're walking off. It, well, that's a stage. This is an altar. But they're walking off the stage, and Coltrane says to this young guy, 19, he says, hey, kid, that was really good. Don't ever do it again. And most people think he meant, don't show me up. You know, like, I want all the applause. That is not what he was saying at all. He's saying, look, jazz players don't ever play the same thing the same way twice. And that is so foreign to the way most of us live. Like, we want to just learn what the rule is and follow the rule. And, he, and he's saying, if you repeat that because you know the crowd reacted, you're going to sell your soul. Because the whole thing that we're doing here is constantly pushing the limits. And I think there's a real spiritual lesson there, okay? Because we can't be spiritually lazy in a slumbering spirit is you know, not necessarily accusing anybody of being lazy, but something caused our spirit man to shut down. And you know, if you're depressed, you sleep more than normal, right? 
because you want to just kind of hide from the world. So the enemy's really good at attacking us and getting us to shut down in certain ways. We could be functioning really well in other areas, but then there could be two or three spots where there's evidence that we're not fully awakened. So the best expression I can give you is always be present to the moment. Uh, another one I'm remembering now was during 9-11 when people were stuck on the elevators coming down, right? They, they didn't realize the, the consequence of getting on the elevator. They just wanted to get out of the building. And uh, when the plane hit, they were stuck in there. And there was all these really high-paid Wall Street executives. And then there was a handyman that was in the building to do, uh, just to, to do normal you know, repair work. So these, these Wall Street guys, hey, they make a lot of money. They got an education, but they didn't know what to do. But the, the handyman had the right tools, and he knew to cut through. You know, when they opened up the doors, there was just a wall in front of them, but he had the tools with him to cut through the wall. And they, they escaped and got out down the stairs, right? So it's not necessarily the one who looks the most equipped. It's the one who doesn't panic and is present to the moment and doesn't allow the enemy to hijack them emotionally because you just don't make good decisions with that. So what this first one says about being present to the moment is a slumbering spirit is a condition in which our personal spirit has not been fully awakened so that certain facets of our lives lie dormant, okay? This doesn't mean a person who falls asleep in church. <laughs> that could just mean they didn't have enough coffee on a Sunday morning. But it could be spiritual. All right, there are times that, you know, the Lord wants to speak to somebody and the enemy will just put them to sleep, right? If they submitted themselves to the wrong thing. But it's, it's making the point clear that it's certain facets of our lives. It's not everything about us. It's just certain facets are lying dormant. Slumbered spirits are primary cause of the powerlessness and sin that we see in the body of Christ. That's quite a statement, isn't it? For something that most of us probably never heard of before tonight, like, whoever heard the expression slumbering spirit, right? But this was a specific word that God gave to John Sanford when he was asking what's wrong with the people that they were trying to counsel. This lesson helps us understand the functions of our own personal spirit or human spirit. If we're not awake in our spirit, we will not be able to function in various areas of our lives. So again, I'm not going to be able to cover all the things that we could talk about tonight. There's a whole book about this, but... We want to be able to think about what causes our spirit to slumber, and we want to avoid those things. How to identify the symptoms of a slumbering spirit, and how to distinguish between soul and spirit, between their true conscience and a remorse conscience. So the Bible talks about a godly sorrow that leads to repentance, and then there's a worldly sorrow that leads to death. Okay, we're going to look at that scripture tonight. The difference is, remorse is, I wish I didn't get caught, basically. I didn't really necessarily do anything wrong. I just got caught. Everybody does it. I'm remorseful that I got caught. That's not a godly sorrow that leads to repentance. A godly sorrow says, if I had it to do over, I would do it differently. I made a mistake, and I feel very bad about the bad decision I made. If that ever happens again, I am not doing that again. Not, I'm, I'm upset that I got caught, okay? Real important, the Lord is close to those of a broken spirit and a contrite heart. Doesn't mean you're heartbroken. It means you're pliable in his hands and you're willing to apologize. Contrite. Anybody grow up with the act of contrition? Remember that expression? Yeah, there's a bunch of us here. Well, I didn't know what it meant as a kid. That's where the word comes from, contrite, contrition. The person's broken in a way to say, man, I feel really bad about the results of that bad decision that I made. It impacted people that I love in a way that I would have never wanted to see happen. That's being alert to the moment as well. All right. It says, our loving Lord made provision. No one needs to remain asleep. Definite steps can be made to awaken slumbering spirits. And they're going to tell us uh, a lot of what Easter was talking about tonight, when you all welcoming each other and saying, hey, you know what? You're a walking, talking, living, breathing hallelujah. That's like medicine. You know, when you get another brother or sister to encourage you like that, it's like medicine. That might have been one of the nicest things anybody said to somebody here all day today. <laughs> it's like 14 hours in and like nothing kind was said or you know you're just in this real contentious environment and you get together with other believers and we draw from each other through the body of Christ and because we're present to the moment if somebody you know in church is off a little bit you'll you'll recognize it and say hey what's up let's pray something's wrong I could tell something's wrong let's pray and man that's so valuable to have that 
All right, so it says, especially in this area, we need the church to be the church, and they emphasize it's the family of God. So family doesn't always have a good connotation for everybody. Maybe you have a dysfunctional family. I heard one guy say, our family put the fun in dysfunction. <laughs> I never forgot that. But, you know, did you ever see the movie The Big Fat Greek Wedding? Right? Like, they were crazy, but they loved each other. Right? That's the takeaway you got. Like, the two families, she went over to his family, and it was just the mother and father in the dining room, and there was no talking going on. It was dead silence. You go to her house, and it's like a circus going on. People spitting at each other and food fights and all this stuff. But they loved each other, and they had each other's back. And, you know, there's a real message in there, isn't there? Which one would you rather be like? I'd rather be with the inmates that are running the asylum because there's life, right? We're living life together. We're recognizing nobody's perfect. We can get mad at each other and still be friends. You know, we can talk to each other and say, hey, what you did, that really bothered me. I still love you, but don't do it again, or I'll call Trish. <laughs> Sorry, Nathaniel. He got triggered. Just trigger warning. <laughs> There's lots of verses we could look at. I just picked a few that kind of really bring this point out, right? 1 Peter 5, 8, New Living Translation says, stay alert. Look at somebody say, stay alert. Stay alert. I'm telling you, it's a really good word. Stay alert. Why? Watch out for your great enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Okay? So it doesn't mean we're afraid of him, but we're aware of him. We know he's there, and we don't let our guard down. We recognize there's a war going on, and he's on the prowl. I'm not afraid of him, but I recognize that if I let my guard down, I could fall, right? And then you can read the whole one. Proverbs 7 is a really profound portion of Scripture. It kind of summarizes, uh, it, I guess you'd say the punchline in a way is ne near the end. It says, with her enticing speech, she caused him to yield. This was a young guy that was seduced by a harlot. She caused him to yield with her flattering lips. She seduced him. Immediately he went after her as an ox goes to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stocks. Till an arrow struck his liver as a bird hastens to the snare, he did not know it would cost his life. Okay? You want a description of what sin does? The wages of sin is death. Okay? And that's, many of us have, have been taken advantage of. We trusted somebody and and, and we were taken advantage of, and we really beat ourselves up about it. And you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't be too harsh on yourself because you have to love yourself and you have to forgive yourself and treat yourself like you would treat somebody you really cared about and loved and not call yourself foolish and call yourself names internally. Forgive yourself and say, let's learn from that. Because if I shut myself down, that's part of that path to the slumbering spirit. I can't trust people. That would be an inner vow, right? People can't be trusted. Everybody's trying to take advantage of me. I'm gullible. I'm naive. I'm stupid. No, you're not. Don't say things that God doesn't say about you. Learn from what the Word says. Be wise as a serpent, gentle as a dove. You've got to be aware that the enemy is out there trying to take you down. Luke 12, 35 to 37 says, Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning, and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master. When he will return from the wedding, that he comes and knocks, they may open the door to him immediately and this part's the key, right? Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. How many want to be that person? That's an alert spirit. You're watching. You're a watchman, a watchwoman. You're on guard. You're looking. You're alert. You're discerning. It's one of the gifts of the spirit, to discern spirits. We could be watching a movie, me, me and my wife, we could be five minutes into it, and she'd go, I don't trust that guy. <laughs> And it takes an hour before you realize he's the bad guy, but she sees it like in the eyes. There's something going on. That's a, that's a gift of discerning of spirits, and it's a very valuable gift in the body of Christ. And if you're making a decision about something, you should call people that you know are mature in the Lord and say, hey, would you pray about this with me? Because I don't want to make a mistake, and I might be missing something. And she might say, Trisha often will say, I don't know what it is, but I have a check in my spirit about it. Let me pray about it. And you might have to wait a little while before you get the answer. And the immature part of our heart wants to say, well, well, it's either yes or no. This isn't complicated. Oh, really? Okay. You want to be like that kid that got seduced? Go ahead. What's the rush? If it's a good idea today, it'll still be a good idea tomorrow. Yeah, that's right. That's right. 
Let me sleep on it. That was the Christian way of saying, I want to pray about it. Let me sleep on it. Matthew 25, 12, he answered and said, Surely I say to you, I don't know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Okay, that was to the virgins who didn't bring the oil. Right? So we get caught on our heels sometimes. We're not prepared. They said, Lord, please let us in. He said, no, I don't know you. Watch, therefore, for you neither know the day or the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. So again, not, not a fear tactic here. It's just the rules of engagement is that we have to be alert to the spiritual dynamic that's going on all around us and things that look good aren't necessarily good. I mean, I had 15 different calls today and my phone said, potential scammer. <laughs> potential scammer. I, yeah, if I don't recognize the number, I can't answer the phone anymore. And if, the, if it's important enough to leave a message, I hate that, that I have to keep checking for my messages, but I'd be wasting half the day. And then another one in Matthew 26, and you all know this one. He came to the disciples and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, what? Could you not watch them feed one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. How many know that one to be true from personal experience, okay? Watch and pray. Watch and pray. Stay alert. Your enemy's prowling around. And then this is a classic, right? All the way back to Genesis. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you don't do well, sin is crouching at the door. And its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Remember that verse, okay? It's never far. The temptation is never far away. Again, I don't live in fear of it, but I live with a great awareness of it because I'm not letting the enemy steal from me. That's what he is. He's a thief and a liar. He's the con man of all time. So I'm staying alert. I'm getting people to agree with me on decisions, especially important decisions. I'm not going to be too proud and say, oh, well, I've been a Christian long enough. I don't, need a, I don't need to ask anybody else's opinion. Oh, guess who's happy about that one? The devil, <laughs> not God. <laughs> it says, when slumbering spirits begin, begin to come to life, the, or so the person who's dealing with a slumbering spirit is starting to recognize it and getting healed. Ironically, what happens is they often run away because of fear. We're more afraid of good than we are of bad. <laughs> That's spoken like a true counselor, right? We flee when good just touches us because it makes us vulnerable, and we'd often rather sleep than be vulnerable. You see how this ties in with that inner vow teaching, right? Because th there's such power in that inner vow to stop you from behaving in certain ways. And it feels like a violation. You hear the echo, don't be a fool. You got burned. You're going to get burned again. You're letting your guard down. Don't be vulnerable. That's a sign of weakness. Well, you could live in that cave for the rest of your life. When are you ever going to trust again? And that's why they said it's so important to be in a body of believers that that you can trust the people that you're with, that they have your best interests at heart, they're not trying to take advantage of you, you're not being duped into doing something else, right? Well, boy, they don't, they, they're afraid to come back out of that cave because they've been hurt so bad in the past. The body of Christ is the power that will bring them out. And C.S. Lewis says it well. This is just a portion. He said, to love all, I'm sorry, at all, to love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything, and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries and avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe and dark and motionless, airless, it will change. It won't be broken, it'll become unbreakable and impenetrable and irredeemable. To love is to be vulnerable. <laughs> so look at somebody and say, to love is to be vulnerable. We need courage. You know, you really do. You need courage to trust people. They will let you down. They're not perfect, but guess what? Neither are you. Hate to break the news. <laughs> but they trust they're trusting you to go forward. Sure beats being alone. 
And then it comes to us now, right? We want to be the healed healers. We want to be the alert ones that can notice when somebody's hurting and, and have medicine from heaven to give to them in the words that we speak to them. It doesn't have to be somebody with five degrees. It's somebody with the Christian spirit, the Holy Spirit, knowing the word, living within the boundaries of, the, of, of God's word. We can be life givers to each other. The counselor must teach those with slumbering spirits to face the pain of life. Doesn't life ask you to swallow some bitter pills? Yeah, well, guess what? Nobody avoids that. And the guy that tried to avoid it was what that poem was about. Yeah, yeah, you can hide your heart and lock it up, but then it becomes untouchable, right? I don't really believe it's ever irredeemable. He used that word. That's probably over the edge. Nothing's irredeemable with God. Nothing's too far gone, amen? So we help people look at it and say, look, that wasn't God's will. That pain that you went through, he came to give you life and give it to you abundantly. The devil is the thief. And God gets blamed for a lot of stuff that the devil does. I can tell you that. <laughs> and we want to help them not to roll over and go back to sleep again. <laughs> the main and most successful cure for a slumbering spirit is vulnerability to others and close relationships with the body of Christ. All right, so... You have to be careful about that, right? You don't want to be alone if you're single. You don't want to be alone with a member of the opposite sex. That, that's a position that could be dangerous, right? So accusations could be made. Things could be said. Not a good idea, right? That, that's, just, that's just good wisdom. You all know probably that Billy Graham used to send somebody in, into the hotel room before he would go in there because he got set up so many times. They were trying to get a picture of him. You know, a naked woman would jump out of the room and they'd try to flash a picture and it wasn't him. It was one of his associates because he was, we would say, he was hip to that plan. <laughs> he understood. The, the devil's slick. And even if it's totally innocent, they'll run with that picture, right? So see why? A man who doesn't rule his spirit or a woman who doesn't rule his spirit is like a city with the walls broken down. It says in Proverbs, you're open to being attacked if you have a hot temper. Right? They'll, they'll get you on film. Everybody has a video in their pocket now. They can all videotape whatever you're doing. And it'll be on the internet forever. It's really true. I mean, people are losing their jobs over something or not getting hired over something they posted when they were in high school on Facebook. You know, just insane. I'm really glad it wasn't around when I was in high school. Oh, man. <laughs> I'd be in the witness protection program somewhere. <laughs> Thank God for his mercy. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, the me I know. <laughs> right. That's why I said the inmates are running the asylum, okay? Like, nobody's going to be throwing stones here. We all live in a glass house. <laughs> but the vulnerability within the body of Christ, that's why it was such a great thing to hear Cindy last week give her testimony that she felt safe. You know, like, it was so beautiful. We should really just give her a hand for being so vulnerable and honest in the way she spoke. And then Sunday, Alan and LaToya, they did the same thing. You know, they just got up and said, we, we felt safe being able to tell our story that we were going to, uh, the people were going to help us heal and not blurt our stuff all around and, you know, lose our confidentiality. And, and that's a super high priority for the body of Christ and for anybody who's in ministry to honor God's children. That's who you all are. You're God's kids. He wants us to take really good care of you, but he also wants us to take good care of each other. And what's acceptable in the world is not kingdom, right? We don't mock each other. We don't name call each other. We cut each other slack. Doesn't mean you just tell them it's okay. If they're doing something wrong, you have to confront it. But only from the angle like, hey, we're all sinners saved by grace. You shouldn't be doing this. It's not going to lead to a flourishing life the way you're living, but not mocking them. All right, so this is what John was de dealing with, this paradox. Christians who've been serving the Lord for many years that he knew were spirit-filled, strong Bible knowledge, and yet still falling into patterns of sin and destructive behavior. We all can think of very famous people in the ministry that had to step down, right? And... The editor of Charisma Magazine said there are so many stories coming in that they can't print them all, that they have to pick and choose which ones are going to print, right? So who, why wouldn't the devil want to go after the shepherds of the flock? Because if you smite the shepherd, the sheep will scatter. So why, everybody should be praying for their pastors. 
or their leaders or the prophet or the evangelist or whoever. My wife was serving under a, an amazing woman when she first got saved, but she wasn't really a pastor. She was a street evangelist, and she used the prophetic gift to get people saved. On Times Square, she would stand on the top of a car with a bullhorn and preach the gospel and then call prophetic words out to the people that were walking by. <laughs> And Trisha was one of the people on the ground praying and, and ministering to the people. And she tells it often, but she said one time it was a pastor from Tennessee who was walking down the street with a prostitute. And this lady calls it out over the bullhorn and told him he was in sin. And the guy falls down on his knees and repents. Like, this is the best evangelism going, right? And when you see that kind of demonstration of power, it really raises the bar that we're not just coming to church to avoid sinning, right? We're coming to be empowered to live that kind of lifestyle and to break off any slumbering parts of our lives. We want to come alive completely to who he wants us to be. So Jimmy Swagger, Jim Baker, there's all these very famous names. Recently, Bill Hybels, you know, who had an amazing track record of, of winning souls and building churches and networking and, and leading other leaders, had to step down. You know, terrible. But what about the intercessors? What about the watchmen that were around these people? Right? Because a lot of times they're looking the other way. They see things, but they're afraid to say something. Well, what's more important? Your job or whether that person has the light bulb go off in their head? Well, whatever. I'm not trying to judge anybody, really, because, uh, you know, like I said, the devil's crouching at the door. He desires to have you. So I'm not above any of, you know, whatever happened to anybody else. And I really value the intercessors that we have in this house. Big time. They need a hand. Give them a hand. Led by the lady down here in the front row. <laughs> so John saying to the Lord, what, how could this be? They know the word. I'm seeing them do miracles. And yet there's this whole gaping hole in their character that's allowing them to sin and, and take advantage of people, this destructive behavior. And look, it, it blows people out of the water. There's people that don't even want to serve God anymore after they see somebody who was famous like that fall. So this is what the Lord said, John, these people do not have an alert and functioning personal spirit. Okay, this is where he came up with this phrase about the slumbering spirit. They could be doing great signs and wonders, but their personal spirit is sleeping in certain areas. It's not fully awakened. We are born with an alive and awakened personal spirit. I don't know about you, but I love little babies. They love me because they can tell I'm a very simple person and we're kind of on the same track with each other. Like, they, I always could kind of lock eyes with them and they're looking and they're checking it out and then eventually they smile. They're like, yeah, he's just like me. Real simple. <laughs> but you could see God in the face of a baby, right? They're so pure. They're so innocent. They're fully awakened. And that's why you see their expressions come on their face. When they don't like something, you know it right away. And only life beats that out of you after a while, right? That was never God's intention. And, and just the, the situations that people get put in, they learn that they have to put their guard up or they're going to get trampled. But that wasn't God's plan. Right? That's, that's sin. So that's what he says. We're born with an alive and awakened personal spirit. But that spirit needs to be met, welcomed, loved, and nurtured. I'm going to say it again. Met, welcomed, loved, nurtured through warm physical affection. All right? So children need to be held by both parents. Okay? It's not the mom's job. Both parents. They need to hear your voice saying, I love you. I cherish you. I treasure you. Did you ever see the movie The Help? Remember how she would speak to that little child? You're kind, you're special, smart. Yeah, she, just, she was just practicing what we're talking about here. You just keep repeating. Like if a lie gets repeated, it starts to sound like the truth. But would you speak the truth over somebody of who they're going to be? And this lady that they had working, watching the kid love the daughter more than the mother did. And, and, you know, you really wanted to jump into the TV and shake that lady you got this beautiful kid, and you're, this time is going by, and you're not getting it back. She needs you to endorse her and encourage her. And people want to feel special, and they are. They're, in, they're made in the image of God. And if you're only ever looking at their faults and criticizing them, yeah, yeah, you did 99 things right, but the one thing you did wrong, I'm going to keep hammering away at that one. In the name of what? Being a good parent? 
No, you just beat them down. And then they give up. That was Jack Frost's testimony, if you remember him. His, his father was a military guy who had been an orphan, and he thought the best way to train his kids was just to make them tough. And Jack Frost just, just bailed on the whole thing. He said, I stopped being my father's son that day when he walked off the tennis court. So it's got to it's gotta be the Jesus way, not, not the carnal way. All right, so it says, to the degree that his spirit is not kept awake or drawn forth, it fails to enter full functioning ability, and he'll stay slumbering in that area. We realize, this is John now talking, as, he, as God was starting to unpack this to him, we realized there were two types, those who were never called to life and those who were, but who had withdrawn, okay? Now, did you ever hear about this? Did you take a parenting class when you were in high school? Did they ever tell you it's really important that children need to be held? No, right? Like, so we, this super important job that we have of raising children, and we get very little coaching about it. And we're never even asked to read a book about it. And most of us are going to do it. So I think there's something wrong with that formula, right? So hopefully the church is here to help in that area as well. All right, so two types, the ones who had been awakened but withdrew and the ones who were never even called to life, which was Jack Frost's father, by the way, right? So hurt people, we know, hurt other people. His father was an orphan. Everybody in the little town in, in I think it was Alabama where he grew up, knew that he was an orphan, so he was kept away. Couldn't go to certain people's houses, couldn't play with certain kids, couldn't be invited over for a sleepover because he was that guy. And that just puts something in him that I'll show them. I'll show them I'm valuable. I'll prove to them. So he did it through sports. And then he went in the military and he became an officer. <laughs> I'd like to be on, on, on his unit. All right. So they, they go on to say, we've come to see that the condition of having a slumbering spirit is one of the epidemic illnesses of our generation. Increasing constantly as nurture dwindles and marriages and homes break apart. So you think there's a strategy of the enemy to attack the family? That less and less people are making a covenant commitment to get married. They're just living together. Even though the statistics show, the secular counselors will tell you, your odds of staying together go down if you live together before you get married. <laughs> they don't care. I'm going to be different. Who said that? Satan. <laughs> right? That's pride. That may apply to everybody else, but not me. I'm different. Yeah, it's just what the enemy wants you to say, right? And then they go on to say, everyone's spirit is asleep to some degree. Now, it's hard to fall asleep during worship in this church. <laughs> Dutch Sheets calls it full contact worship. <laughs> well, look, we have something to celebrate, so we're going to celebrate. If you don't feel like celebrating, come a little later. That's fine, but we're into it. So not everybody likes that. They think, they think God's going to be mad at us or he's sleeping and we might wake him up. <laughs> God does not have a slumbering spirit. <laughs> so they're going to talk about nine areas. I'm going to get to those nine areas on the handout here. Am I doing on time? Okay. So it says some fail to function in all nine areas, some only in one or two. And again, I'll, we'll get to those nine areas. None of us is fully awakened or fully slumbering. But I just want to put in the plug for the prophetic lifestyle, okay? Because that's that verse from Job that says, a stump, there's hope for a tree, even if it's cut down at the scent of water, it will spring back to life again. And that's what the prophetic spirit and the prophetic lifestyle does for you. It keeps you awakened because it becomes this wonderful interactive relationship with God where you know that he's speaking to you and you learned how to recognize his voice and other people in the church are coming up to you and say, hey, you, you came up in my spirit this morning when I was praying. Is everything okay? And you're like, man, God loves me. This is cool. These people are awakened in their spirit. Did it happen? <laughs> yeah, don't be hitting each other about it. But I wouldn't want to live any other form of Christianity. See, that's what I meant before when I said, we're not giving ourselves awards because we didn't commit adultery today, right? That's setting the bar too low. We're not trying to manage our sin and say, okay, whew, made it through another day. No mortal sins. A couple of venials, but no mortals. You know, you remember that language, right? No, I'm here on a mission for God. 
I'm an ambassador of the kingdom. What did I do to advance the kingdom today? And how is he going to help me? A million different ways. If we're awakened and alert and asking him, he puts so many opportunities in front of us. All right? So it says in, in the areas of the relationship to God, man and nature, or to their own beings, that's, that's the areas where we have these slumbering aspects. So relationship to God, relationship to man or our environment, or even to our own selves. That's, that's a big one. The sleepers can't function fully in their spirits. This means that they come to God mentally and emotionally, but never really meet him. They relate to the forms and to the liturgy and the doctrine and theology, the law or the plan of salvation, but not daddy, not his person. And this was a big part of why the revival that happened in the mid-90s that started in Toronto, one of the major themes of that was the love of the Father. And it happened to be at a time when the music was also starting to turn a little bit to just not just singing about God, but singing in the first person to God. Wow, that was awesome. I was so happy to be part of that because that's what touched a part of my heart that he really does care about us. I can sing to him, not just about him. And he wants me to do that. He actually likes it. Mm. This is the air I breathe. This is my daily bread. I'm desperate without you. Man, that's a love song to God. Hard to believe they weren't doing that back in the day. So they can share emotions, they can weep over lost souls, and they can even weep about their own sins through remorse, but they're unable to commune with Jesus or share in his sufferings. Now, what a, that could go in a whole bunch of different directions, couldn't it? Sharing in his sufferings. Here's what I want to believe that he means by this, is that he came and he wept when he saw Mary's heart broken over her brother Lazarus, right? He felt what we feel. He knows everything about us. There was nothing that we experienced that he didn't go through. Well acquainted with sorrows, the Bible says in Isaiah, right? And yet, without sin, and yet still intercedes for us, and yet still loves us, and will leave the 99 to come and find us. So the suffering is, there's a lot of pain all around us, and it's easy to retreat and join like the spiritual, I don't want to be sounding judgmental again, but like a, a club. We join a club where everybody dresses nice and looks good and drives a nice car and we all have praise the Lord kind of relationships, but nobody ever shares their pain because it's not politically correct to have pain. Good Christians don't have pain. <laughs> That's a lie. But we can't be vulnerable with each other because we have to keep up some kind of image. Well, that's not the church of Jesus. He was hugging lepers. Nobody would even touch them. He was hugging them. Okay? So what does that tell us? He thinks it's okay for us to embrace other people's pain and be in the pain with them. And he'll give us the goods because we're going to be in pain sometime too. And we'll want people to be in it with us too. Right? So as you give, so you receive. You're willing to put yourself out for others, they'll put themselves out for you too. And we're all going to have that turn where we need somebody ministered to us too, right? So he says, he quotes Philippians 3, that I may know him, Jesus, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. One way is ministering to other hurting people and not knowing what to do. We could, we could be talking to somebody and they describe a situation that seems really, really difficult. And we don't have the right answer. But, you know, the Bible says in Romans 8 that the Holy Spirit comes alongside us and helps us in that moment and actually prays through us when we don't know what to say. And that's what God wants is that we're putting ourselves out there and helping other people to move forward in God. Get past this thing that's holding you down. And then the rest of that verse is being conformed to his death, meaning I put down my agenda and I take on his. I'm conformed. Lord, I want your will done, not my will, but your will be done. By any means, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. And again, I just love the testimonies that we heard the last two weeks, last Tuesday with Cindy and then Sunday with Alan and Latoya, uh, and, and the healing testimony that we heard also, that was just unbelievable, like amazing. What was the name of that disease again? Yeah, man, I can't pronounce it now either. 
intracranial hypertension where yeah your body thinks you have a brain tumor but you don't tell me that's not demonic how much pain do you have now zero okay zero that's encouraging but i'll tell you what that's encouraging so um here we go just finishing up this point is that they have no ability to empathize empathize with the lord or with others and they're relegated and confined to the necessity oh this is a this is kind of a technical term here but the necessity of calculating and estimating what others think and feel that is not who you want to be okay you can't get so locked down that you're just trying to calculate what the other person's feeling you want to be able to cry with people who are crying you want to feel what they're feeling to a point, you know, that can, that's next week's class, the blessing of burden bearing. You have to learn that it is a blessing, but if you take on too much burdens, then you could break too. Okay, so where do we draw the line on how much am I supposed to carry with this person and how much are others supposed to help here too, right? It's not all on us. So John says, kind of rhetorically, one might ask, what about Holy Spirit? He's the very giver of life. His task is to make us alive. Why didn't these people come awake when Holy Spirit came in? Good question, right? Some did. But when I asked the Lord that question, he answered me by telling me to picture a river. Okay, and he says that river represents Holy Spirit flowing through a person's life. He, he then said, picture a rock in the middle of the river, unmoved, the water cascading against it and around it. That rock represents the personal spirit of some people, hardened and incapable of participating in the flow of Holy Spirit's life. Good picture, right? And hearts of stone, we talked about that, right? A heart of stone is not somebody who's calloused. It's somebody who has stopped feeling and can't receive the ministry from other people because they've hardened that part off. And we want to call that thing back to life again. That's what the resurrection is, right? It's not just coming back from the dead. It could be part of your personality that's been calloused and scar tissue and, and needs to be brought back to life again. God can do it. That's a miracle, but God can do it. So the Holy Spirit is there, and he's flowing through the man or woman's mind and heart and emotions and body. The person could be preaching brilliantly, working miracles, and say mighty prophecies. But the man's own spirit can't participate. It lies asleep encased and non-functioning it's a lot to this right you can see how a lot of the different classes that we did describe this in different ways and they're coping mechanisms that we do and the lord's saying no i have such a better life for you um so I, i'm if it's okay alan and i'm gonna take a quote from what you said on sunday is that all right because we talked already today about you know the testimony and i always give people time I don't just post it up on the internet because we say it. We want them to hear it and look at it and just make sure, you know, sure you want us to put it up there after you had a chance to pray and all. And, you know, that was a good thing. But I just want you to hear some of the language of how his spirit came awake. And he wasn't planning it when he said it this way, but you can, I actually could see some of the pattern in here, okay? So if you were here Sunday, you heard him say it, and I edited it a little bit. It's not exactly word for word, but I summarized a couple of things. But he said, about 12 years ago, I received a word from God that I would give a fatherly touch to men who had not received a fatherly touch. That's a good word, isn't it? That's a huge problem in our culture. The orphan spirit is rampant in our culture. People without a father. The Father, God. So you get this prophetic word that says you are going to receive a gift of a fatherly touch to other people. That's awesome. And he said, but that, that really impacted me, but I felt that's a strange word because I hadn't received a fatherly touch. Does that matter to God? No. <laughs> See, it helps if you had it, for sure, because in one sense it's hard to give what you didn't get, but God's not stopped by that. He fills in the gaps, right? Danny Silk calls it a toolbox deficiency. You might not have been given the tools in your natural life growing up, but God fills your toolbox, and now he makes you capable where you weren't capable before. So Alan was just being honest, saying, well, that's a strange word because I didn't feel like I had that when I was coming up. 
And he said, the problem was it was a very difficult process for me. It felt like I would take two steps forward and two steps back. I always felt stuck. Can anybody relate? Okay. Fast forward to King of Kings. I hear Pastor Tricia talking about how deliverance has changed her life and how she's seen it change so many others' lives. I realized that was the missing link. I did the homework, sent it in, and got an appointment. I'm sitting in deliverance, and I could tell you I was walked through a difficult process with love and professionalism, so that's that trust factor that's so important, right? I'm sitting in deliverance, and I can... Oh, I'm sorry, I read that. I am definitely, definitely changed my walk and my relationship with Christ, and at the same time, this class, Possessing Your Vessel, was happening. We started attending the classes and saw how powerful the two were together, all right? So we'll stop for a minute there and just think about it. This class is... You know, I, I heard one person said, I only came because they told me if I wanted to get involved in ministry at the church, I thought I had to take the class. I didn't even know what the class was about, but I wanted to get involved, so I came. And, you know, kind of rocked her world, but praise God that, that she came. And that's a good reason, right? But the point is, it's like a uh, CAT scan. That When you go to a doctor, they're, we're just doing a CAT scan. We're not saying there's anything wrong, but here are some of the things that a lot of people have to deal with in life. So see where you stand. See if the Lord shows you anything. Pray about it. Ask the Lord to reveal things that, that might be sitting there in hiding. So it's true. The class does work hand in hand with deliverance, but it's not a requirement. We're not saying everything's a demon, right? But if, you're, if you've worked through a bunch of stuff and you're still not getting progress, it might be. So what's the harm in letting somebody pray? If nothing's there, nothing will happen. If something's there, something will happen. <laughs> You'll come out lighter. <laughs> and there's no shame around it, right? Now, it feels like there is before you go through it, but no. Every one of us has something that can go, right? <laughs> So the classes were running and started attending, and the two were powerful together. I'm now walking out that word that God gave me 12 years ago. How cool is that? So even though the word was given, it was dormant. And I believe all of us here probably have some part of our lives that's not fully awakened yet. And it's not that you become what the Sanfords call a navel starer, right? You don't want to be so introspective that all you can do is sit around and say, oh, my God, I'm such a mess, I'm such a mess, and you're staring at your belly button, right? No, that's not who God called us to be. The kingdom of God suffers violence. The violent take it. They go out and take it. But we want to take it from a position of health, emotional health, spiritual maturity, not doing it for performance orientation reasons or some other wrong identity, right? There's so many counterfeits out there. So yes, we move forward, but we do it with humility. We do it with this in mind, that the greatest position is to serve. If you're here to rule me, we're probably not going to work too well together. If you're here to serve with me, great, let's do it, right? When are we ever called to rule? You, you have authority, but the best rulers are servants in Jesus' mind. It can't ever be about us, right? It's about him. So I'm just finishing Alan's point here. He said, I'm walking out that word that God gave me 12 years ago. How many of you would like to say, I'm walking out the word that I received X years ago? Yes, I say it. By faith, you are going to do this. Whatever's holding it back is going to be lifted off. That cap is coming off, and you're going to fulfill that calling, and we will pray through it with you because this is God's plan for your life. The enemy has a plan for your life too. He doesn't win. God will win. Yeah. Hmm. And then he said, I work with men every day. And the most common theme I see is that they have not had fatherly figure in their life. So there's a the big demand for this calling, isn't there? And I approach every one of these men with respect and love. And I kind of summarize and said, I'm seeing great results. But he said, most of the time, they give me respect back. <laughs> That's part of the suffering is you're being kind to them. And you don't always get the kindness back. Uh, that's true, right? They're, they're leaking their pain. You're there, somebody that's finally listening to them, and, and they're going to test you and see. Uh, I don't know, have, have any of you ever heard of a lady named Jackie Pullinger in a book called Chasing the Dragon? Got one hand up in the back, another one down here. That was uh, mandatory reading when we first started the church. I won't go too far into the story, but she went 
on a, she literally got a one-way ticket from London when she was 18 years old, English girl from a wealthy family in England, one-way ticket to Hong Kong, and stayed there her whole life doing ministry in the streets and saw signs and wonders and miracles and worked with heroin addicts. And she lived in, in really horrible poverty in order to reach the worst of the worst and just saw miracle after miracle. The BBC actually did a story about her because they heard so many reports about her, they couldn't believe it. So that she went over there. But one of the things she said to me was that the uh, gang leaders came to her three years after that she was there. And in the beginning they said, we didn't like you because our customers stopped using heroin after they met you. <laughs> so you were bad for business. <laughs> They said, we've been watching people like you come through Hong Kong for years. Nobody lasts. They all come in with great intentions, but they're, always, they're all gone within a couple of months. You've been here for three years, and we respect what you're doing. It was bad for business, but you're good for the community. <laughs> oh, God help us. Even the thieves acknowledged God. It was amazing. But as part of helping people they had to live together and they were bringing them in their home even though there wasn't any room in the home by anybody else's standards it was like there's always got to be room for the next one because what if somebody said that to me sorry no more room so the conditions were tough and these people were coming off drugs and they're going through withdrawal and she would trust people and try to give them money or support and they would steal from her and she'd go to the lord like what's wrong with this picture I'm trying to help these people, and they're stealing from me. Things I really, you know, things of mine that mean something to me, they're stealing it and selling it for the drug money. And this is how the Lord showed it to her, is that this is sharing in my sufferings. If you really want to fulfill my call, you have to recognize it's part of their process in order to get where they want to go. Now, look, that doesn't justify people mistreating you. I'm not trying to make that point. But if you're really all in for God, and you know this is your calling, then you live with those things because there's a higher purpose involved than this light and momentary affliction. That's how Paul said it, right? The trials that we go through now are light and momentary afflictions compared to the glory that will be revealed in us on his return. Somebody say amen. amen. <laughs> and then you mind, Alan, I hope it's okay. I'm reading this, but I love this part when you said, at first I thought God was telling me to come up higher. I would try to study harder, read more, pray harder. And I realized for me it wasn't come up higher. Okay, so that could be where part of this little slumbering piece was going on for him because working harder doesn't get you out of it. He said, God was saying, just open your arms and let me in. Receive me. It's a gift. It doesn't matter the walls you built. This is like God speaking to Alan. It doesn't matter the walls you built. I'm breaking them down. You want me to move a mountain? I'll move a mountain for you. No problem. And then he finished by saying, I've never seen this kind of freedom in my entire life. <laughs> Only God could do that. Amen? So what might have been slumbering before has now been awakened. There's a calling that you're stepping into, and praise God, we now all know to pray for you in that calling and in the career that you have. Like, wow, that's like if you want to heal the sick and you're a nurse, you're in a really good spot. <laughs> kind of built right into the job. All right, let's look at the handout, okay? Did everybody get one? Okay, sorry if we didn't make enough copies, but I saw Cindy passing them out. I can't get through this whole thing, but it's worth going through. I just want to hit some of the highlights and talk about how, you know, we can climb out of the hole a little bit here. And then there's a prayer that we'll pray on the back at the end. All right, so we kind of covered the first page, so you can flip over. And again, I'm just going to emphasize what they said on the top of page 162 there. It says, knowledge of the slumbering spirit is one of the most powerful and incisive keys given to believers. Now, again, that's surprising to me because it's not a commonly known phrase, right? And they're saying it's one of the most powerful. And it also reveals a primary cause for powerlessness and sin that we see so much in the body of Christ. 
What is it? Condition of the personal human spirit, where it hasn't been fully awakened or has fallen asleep so that certain facets of our lives are empty. How do we, when do we look for this condition? All right, so this is when there's been a partial healing. I kind of, Alan was saying, I was saved 12 years. I was a Christian. I knew the Bible. I was going to church, but there was still something holding me back from fulfilling that calling. So when healing has occurred, but this person still cannot, I'll say, fully function, and when in particular areas there's no manifest strength of character. So that's that preacher who's having uh, disc uh, discretions. Like he's, he's, he's having behavioral, he's cheating, he's infidelity, like some kind of sin. Wait a minute, you know the word. You're doing all these signs and wonders. How could that be? Disconnect, okay? So there's evidence there. The condition affects Christians and non-Christians. Uh, and then I'll go to the one that says the distinction between soul and spirit, okay? Uh, those structures of the heart, our soul, structures of the heart and mind, character and personality that we erect, they're built as our spirit encounters life and reacts, setting up coping mechanisms, okay? Now, wherever that's godly, keep them, but wherever it's not godly, don't keep them, right? You might have a structure of saying, I don't, I don't leave my house until I've put an hour of time into the Bible. Good. That's a good structure, right? Be flexible. Like, don't be so rigid about it and be religious, but that's a good pattern. So not all structures are bad, but you might have started to rely on, you know, I really need a drink. <laughs> no, you don't. Sorry. Hate to break the news. You don't need a drink. Once in a while, I'm not criticizing it, but if you start building that as, oh man, things are really bad, and every time things are bad, I have to eat haagen -Dazs. <laughs> How's that different than a drink? It's just another form of comfort, right? Okay, you get my point. And then spirit, different, it's eternal, it's that which was God breathed into us from the beginning, and which will return to him. That's the part that will live forever. Then the soul is both temples. It says in some areas, the soul is a beautiful temple, through which the spirit can express itself wholesomely. In others, it's a prison or an armored warship for attacking others. <laughs> All right? So now that's where our, the condition of our soul and our spirit man really have an impact in how, what the behaviors are in our lives. It gives us some verses up there. I didn't break those all out for you, but you can look them up. And then it gets to the nine functions that, uh, that they mentioned earlier. So I think it's worth going through that list, okay? It says, it's in the following nine areas that the slumbering spirit cannot operate. Now, where did they come up with this? This is just their practical counseling experience because they didn't learn this from anybody but the Lord. So it's not, I don't think, meant to be a comprehensive list. It's just their experience where they saw how this would manifest. Use this list to determine whether you are ministering to one whose spirit slumbers. All right, so the first one, to sustain worship. And in corporate worship, a, an awakened per personal spirit will sense the presence of God. A slumbering spirit can only believe by faith that God is present. They're not sensing. Sometimes people will say, I'll just get there after worship. I'm not, I'm not relating to what you guys are doing as worship. All right, whatever. Judgment-free zone. That would be a sign. Like, I remember going to a Promise Keepers conference in 1994, and we were in Boulder, Colorado, in an outdoor stadium, football stadium. There's probably 10,000, I don't know, 10,000 men in an outdoor stadium, almost a mile high, and they were, we were all singing worship at the same time. It was unbelievable. I never heard anything like it. 10,000 men's voices all singing at the same time with their hands up in this beautiful, pure air, crystal clear sky. Like if you couldn't sense God's presence, something was really wrong. But some people can't, right? So we want to pray for them, for that slumbering, you know, get the kiss, right? Wake up with that kiss from the Lord. All right, so then the second one is your private devotions with God. An awakened spirit can be with God and feel his love. Slumbering people, the devotions are dry, and the word is also dry. So what do you do about that? You have to first recognize it, that I'm not really getting much out of my devotions or I'm not doing them and I'm skipping it. 
So, you know, we've been trying to encourage people to take communion in the morning before you do your devotions and get down, literally get down on your knees, make your body bend and, and remember, do this in remembrance of me and say, Lord, come in and help me now as I'm about to crack open this bread of life, make it come alive to me. When you're intentional like that, uh, I don't want it to be a religious you know, ritual, but I, I have found it to be super helpful, right? So recognize if there's an issue and, and say, no, devil, you are not stealing my devotions from me. This is an important time for me to get my instructions for the day. And then listening for revelation from God. Awakened Christians have spiritual dreams, see visions, and hear from God. But slumberers cannot hear him and often think those who do fool themselves. <laughs> Maintaining health. And they're given verses for a lot of these, not every single one, but a lot of them. An awakened person quickly recovers from illness. If the condition is serious or terminal, the spirit can still thrive. Slumberers heal slowly and will despair when illness strikes. I love this part. Original insight and inspiration. An awakened spirit is inspired to creative acts. All right, so I was just talking to one of the board members in our church, and he's been really busy with his job, and he uh, works for a manufacturing company that sells to some of the really big corporations in America. I want him to give the testimony but when he's ready. And he said um, they, they were trying to solve a certain problem. And while he was on vacation, while he was in the shower, a picture popped in his brain of the exact invention that they have now have patented. That's the Lord. That's an awakened spirit. The whole company's making money because of something God dropped in his spirit. He took it from a, an idea, drew it out, exactly what he saw, took it to engineers. They designed it, and now it's for sale, and they've already recovered all the cost of all that R&D, you know, re research and development to get it built. It's all already covered. In, in the first conference, they sold enough to cover the whole cost. It's God. That's God. Creativity. Songs of the Lord. A million different ways you could think of it. That's what we want. That's what he wants in us. So if you're not receiving that, ask him. Say, Lord, show me what's causing my spirit to, to slumber. I want to be fully awakened. We'll pray it tonight as well. And then this is one that you might not think about too often, but ability to relate to, the to time, past, present, and future. You may not know this, but John Sanford was part Osage Indian. Okay? And he frequently talked about the prophetic aspect of having that native uh, genetic code in him, that they were more alert spiritually as, uh, by, their, by their DNA. Now, granted, a lot of that was not godly, but you know that doesn't mean it can't be directed towards God when it gets redeemed, right? So this is the kind of thing that he would typically say, how we relate to time, past, present, and future. An awakened one receiving ministry can remember the good times and project with real hope that the good times will come again. Slumberers are confined to the pain of the moment. So Dutch Sheets wrote a book called Tell Your Heart to Beat Again. It's the same idea. I'm shut down. I don't even want to dream because I don't want to be let down. See, that's the enemy. That's not God, okay? In the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Come on, you know it, right? Your young men, dream dreams, see visions, prophesy. That's what an active spirit does. That's when Holy Spirit's inside of us. So we can relate to time and not be bound by that slumbering thing that wants to keep us locked in the past. Empathetic communication, awakened spirits can sense the meaning behind another person's words, and slumberers track with the mind only. That's so valuable to see that we have to meet spirit to spirit with people. You know, and in this culture that we live in with so many texts and so many emails, and so f it's actually considered rude in my business to call somebody if you don't text them first and say, do you have time for a call? I'm not the only one. You guys are shaking your heads like, when did that happen? You can't just call anybody anymore. It's considered rude. So get as much done with your thumbs as you can. Oh my God, forget it. Spell checker, here I come. <laughs> this is, you know, obviously not one we're going to talk about too much, but it's important 
intimacy is really what they're getting at here, that married couples, when their spirits are awakened, receive a much higher level of intimacy. They connect spirit to spirit than just feeling like they're fulfilling their duty to one another, right, when it comes to intimacy. No, don't let the devil rob that. Fight for your marriage. Fight for your intimacy. Stay in that place where, where you're staying open to one another and, and asking the Lord to help you in this area. Awaken lovers. Meet whole being to whole being. Sex for slumbers is reduced to just physical contact, physical titillation. And then nine, a mature conscience. Awakened Christians possess a true conscience which works to keep them from sinning. That's the point about ministers that fell into sin. Their conscience was not awakened, and they could be preaching one minute and then committing a, sin, a sexual sin the next minute and not be aware in their spirit. It's like it says in Scripture, conscience is seared with a hot iron in that area. No, that's not who we're going to be. Make that confession. I am going to live with an awakened spirit. Yes. And then it says, although we refer to slumberers in this lesson for exper expedience and clarity, remember to describe behaviors rather than assign labels. That applies to all the classes that we've run, anything that we've talked about. If somebody is bound by performance orientation, it's just describing the behavior. It's not labeling them with a name or somebody dealing with parental inversion problems from that. You know, we're not, we're not labeling anybody. We're just saying this is a, a way to describe the behavior that you're, you're dealing with. Um, I'm going to just skip over. You could read this next part, but it gets to that point about remorse versus godly sorrow versus remorse. And uh, I'm going to get down to the bottom of page 165, okay? I like what they said here. All right, about halfway down. When, when we are not called to life through nurture, affectionate touch, and parental guidance, that's what causes our spirit to slumber. So when we can call each other to life and we can recognize each other, we can make up for that deficiency that happened when we were children, okay? So that's what the Lord does. That's why he keeps referring to us as a family. If we can trust each other, then we can call each other to life. And then it says, definition of a human being, which probably sounds odd, but look how he says it. One who has an awakened personal spirit by which he or she identifies with others and cherishes what is in the other person more than his or her own life. One who has become like Jesus, fully human, fully spiritual, and able to love in both realms. And then to the parents, what's your function? to mature your children into their humanity. It's a good way to say it, huh? Show love through plentiful, affectionate touch. Draw the spirit to life. Just look up for a minute, okay? Because have you ever been in a restaurant or a baseball game or someplace where you see where the parent and the child are not connecting well? And, and, the, and the parent looks annoyed that they have to take care of this child. Like the kids pick up on that big time, right? But when you can genuinely show that you love being with the child, even though you don't always like the behavior that they're doing, that makes all the difference. Because I want to be with you. You're not, you're not second place. I'm not here, but I'm only tolerating this. I'm celebrating our time together. I love being with you. They pick up on that both ways. If it's just a duty or an obligation, or you're rolling your eyes, or you're always checking your phone and looking at Facebook, you know, they pick up on all of that. That's a form of rejection, big time. So when you're with them, be fully engaged. And if you don't necessarily love it yet, you have these children. <laughs> They're God's kids. <laughs> Ask them, increase my love. I want them to believe and know that I really do love being with them, even though it might be hard for me to show it sometimes. And then it says to draw the spirit forth to life, to provide boundaries and discipline, to build strength of character into the child. What does that mean, build strength of character into the child? There's so many different ways that could happen in the course of how life goes. How many remember this when you were growing up? You committed to going to one party, but then you got invited to a better party. And you went to your parents and said, what should I do? And they said, you got you to stay true to your word. That's building strength of character, right? 
don't, don't go back on, on what your promise was. There'll be other parties to go to. You said you were going to do it, follow through. How about your child comes home and says, uh, this happened in our family. Our son was wrestling. He had never done it before. And the night before his first match, he said, I want to quit the team. I don't want to do it. And we looked at each other and said, we would not be helping him to let him bail on this thing. This is very understandable. You're out there on the mat, and it's just you and one other person, and the whole thing, everybody's watching. You can't hide. If you get pinned, there's no excuses. You can't blame it on the other player on the team, right? And we said, no, you got to stick this out. And he'll tell you to this day, he's 33 years old. He said he never learned more from anything else this is the one in medical school, right? He's a smart kid. He's learned a lot. He said, I learned more from sports than anything else throughout my whole <laughs> upbringing when it came to life lessons and character. And that's why sports can be valuable. Not always, but it can be. All right. So then um, what else? We want to develop their, their true conscience and uh, find, find that calling in the person that God called them to be and keep speaking it out over them. He goes into fathers and mothers here, but I recognize the time. It's, it's almost 8.30, so I want to get to the prayer. Um, he actually gives you a couple of lists of things that are much worse today than, than when this was written back in the 80s about crime rates and divorce rates and how people are dual careers or sacrificing family and children being raised by you know, caretakers instead of the parents. Not meaning to condemn anybody, but recognize there's a price that's paid for that. And uh, whenever possible, just celebrate your children and let them know you love being with them. And then let's go to page 167 and we'll say the prayer when we're done with this, okay? It says, uh, ministering to that slumbering spirit. Determine what quality of nurture was provided by the parents, especially the father. Pray out loud, enabling each person to forgive their parents, especially through the father. A little theme coming up here, huh? Pray life into the person and focus on their affected areas. Pray to resurrect the spirit that either never awakened or fell asleep because of pain or the deadening effects of sin. And then pray nurturing prayers. So what might this look like? It's a friend of yours. You're praying together with them. The Lord has shown you that there's some of this aspect of a lack of nurture. They need positive reinforcement. They need what you're seeing. This is what God is showing me about you. You are going to reach this potential. Now, I'm not, don't make it up. That's a sin, right? You have to really be hearing from the Lord on this. You can't just make up your own imagination. But the Lord will show you because he's in this transaction. He wants us helping each other. And he'll show you what he sees about that person. And you're helping call them to life. Yeah, I mean, we've had husbands call us up and say, what did you do to my wife? Yeah, like, because we started speaking positively over, and if he wasn't a Christian, he's like, I'm not letting her come back to that church because you're messing her up. Because <laughs> now all of the old tools he was using wasn't working anymore. She was starting to recognize who she really was. I said, well, you know, you can come down and we'll talk if you want tell you what we're doing, and you're going to like the, the new version a lot better. And that's true. Um, the needs of the slumberer, it's hard to be vulnerable. So one-on-one -on -one ministry where they feel like they can trust you is really important. If they haven't talked to people a lot, they may go on for a while, and you let them. You let them go on. You recognize, and they're making up for lost time. They haven't let some of this stuff out in a really long time. Have you ever noticed that people will say, I don't know why I'm telling you this. I never talk like this to anybody. That's the God in you that they're seeing, that they know that they can trust. Let them talk. Don't shut them down. Don't look at your watch. Put your phone somewhere far away <laughs> so you won't be distracted. They're like, why are you listening to me? That's the God in you that wants them to be called out. Come out of that slumber. All right, so one-on-one -on -one ministry. The family of God and good worship within it. Unconditional love from many people. Affection from those around him or her. Hugs appropriately, obviously, but it really matters to folks that have been slumbering to just be held sometimes. You see us do it at the altar. Often, typically, it would be a woman hugging a woman and a man or a man. It's fine, but... Many times also stand in the gap on behalf of the father or mother 
or the person that hurt them and just say, you might not have ever heard them say, would you forgive me, but we'll stand in the gap with you. And that could be a really powerful way to get past that hurdle. Don't do it unless the Lord is leading you to do it, but he may lead you to do that. I like this one too. Learn to play. <laughs> right? They haven't had much fun because they've been slumbering and might be a little awkward. Uh, Paula Sanford told a story one time where she was outside. They had a big family uh, reunion at their house, and she was outside in the backyard playing with her grandchildren. Most of her adult children were in the house, but they were looking out the window at Paula, and the girl, the, the granddaughter was in the, they had a boat that was up on the trailer, but they were pretending that the boat was in the water, and the girl, a little girl was driving the boat, and Paula was pretending she was behind the boat like a skier, <laughs> and she was bouncing up and down, and all her adult children were in the house looking out the window, like, look at her, she's still doing this. Same thing she did for us when we were growing up. She's having a blast with her granddaughter, and that means so much to that child that you're fully engaged with them now and that you're not just tolerating them. Wow. You're celebrating them. <laughs> read, uh, they like to say child childlike romances or fantasies, like he would say like uh, C.S. Lewis, Narnia, right? Those kind of stories that allow their minds to really grow and expand, but it's not Harry Potter, <laughs> okay? And then for the older people, go to, to, go to movies that, that really stir emotions because they're not used to having their emotions stirred. And, you know, there's so many great movies that, that could fit that bill, right? And then the personal disciplines, we talk about that a lot. Pray daily, choose life, seek out hugs, read scripture. Um, you really could also add to there, somehow volunteer to help people that are worse off than you. You know, work on, on, a, on in Marstown, they have a soup kitchen volunteer to go up there and look other people in the eye who are, are worse off than you and just keep reminding yourself, I'm so blessed. I'm so blessed. Keep counting your blessings. And then participating in small groups, we're uh, really going to push the, that once we move. All our efforts right now are focused on the move, but we're going to be um, rolling out a new plan for small groups after we move so that we can all get more connected with each other. Everybody good? Did you learn anything? Hope you did. Press in a little bit more on this topic, and God will show you things. Let's stand, and we'll just read that prayer on the back, okay? And then if we have any prayer ministry uh, folks here, come on up now. Me and Easter. Oh, no. Okay. A couple more. Got the prayer? See it? All right, let's read it out loud together. A prayer for slumbering spirit. You're not reading out loud. <laughs> All right, here we go. Lord, I recognize my spirit is not fully functional, not fully awake in several areas. For some reason, and then you have to do that on your own, my spirit chose not to enter into life. I confess this sin. I have put my light under a bushel. Like Jonah, I have fled from the life you designed for me. And as with Jonah, my refusal to live in these areas has caused trouble. Can I stop for a minute? Do you remember when Cindy taught a couple weeks ago on spiritual rebellion? Same thing. See that? See how they're tied together? That you're rejecting the identity that God gave you and you're actually angry about it. And now you've rebelled against God and said, I wish you never made me like this, whatever the like this is. Well, it's the same thing. They pulled away. It says, I fled from the life you designed for me. And as with Jonah, my refusal to live in these areas has caused trouble, right? So let's repent of that. All right, let's pick it up again. I ask your forgiveness for the ways in which I have wounded those around me. Lord, I ask your forgiveness for being unwilling to live life. God, I ask you to awaken my spirit. Cleanse my spirit and remove the cobwebs. Thank you for not giving up on me. Now I ask you to be even more persistent. Touch my ear so I can hear you speaking to me. Lord, I choose life. I make a conscious decision to be fully present. Say that again. Lord, I choose life. 
I make a conscious decision to be fully present. And I ask you to hold me to that decision, even if at times I don't want to. Bring to death in me that impulse to flee. I ask that your resurrection life strengthen and enable me to develop new ways to respond in each of these areas in which I am slumbering. Help me to see your call to life as a loving call. Help me see the call from those who love me in the same way. Set a guard over my life so I can respond to that call in a good way. I thank you, Father God, for my life. Say that one again. I thank you, Father God, for my life in Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to bless you all, okay? Lord, I thank you for your tribe at King of Kings and for this hungry group of people. Your word says that you reward those who diligently seek after you, and that's who these folks are. They've been diligently coming out and diligently seeking you. And Lord, when we ask, you, get, you answer. So we will keep on knocking. We will keep on praying, keep on seeking, and we will find what you want to show us because we're going to be those diligent seekers. In any area where our spirits are slumbering, we ask you to awaken us and embrace the life that you gave us and bloom where we're planted. We might not like the situation we're in, but we can make the best of what we're in while we're here until you move us and promote us on to the next thing. Lord, we want to celebrate life, not tolerate it. And we just ask you to awaken us to our full potential in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. amen. All right, if you could just come up that aisle there and wait till one of the teams is available if you need prayer. Till we meet again, have an awesome night.